<laughs> All right, well, we're gonna um, we're gonna start up the uh, the last hour of uh, of the lectures this morning. Um, just for 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 what it's worth, tomorrow uh, Dr. Hart is gonna stay over with us, and uh, he's gonna teach our adult Sunday school class tomorrow morning. Uh, it, it's it's I guess somewhat related, more generally, but not a, it's not exactly a continuation of the conference itself. Uh, but if you're able to come tomorrow morning, we'd love to have you. Um, but uh, with that being said, I'll hand things over to Dr. Hart. Thank you. I hope I don't trigger anyone with these some of these images here. Um, when you when you do a Google search for images with evangelical, this is the sort of thing you get. I didn't it, it was I didn't have to look hard to get this. Um, and there's, live in a free country, there's not necessarily anything wrong with that, right? So um, typically it's not the way Presbyterians, though, worship, as you'll see in some other slides, even though these, these are um, <clears throat> uh, maybe unfair comparisons, what I have here. So finally then, we've, so we've looked at Machen in relation to 19th century Presbyterianism Earlier this morning, we looked at Machen in relation to de developments between, say, 19, excuse me, 1869 and 1930 or so, <clears throat> and in relation to mainline Protestantism. And then the next piece of the puzzle for um, the history of American Protestantism is to think about evangelicalism <clears throat> and how Machen relates to evangelicalism, um, what came after him. It's a little bit of an unfair comparison because Machen died in 1937, and as I'll say a little bit more, we think what we identify today as evangelical, although tomorrow I'll talk more about different ways that we identify, think about evangelical, how we define it, but um, typically people who are uh, asking questions of Americans about whether they're born again or something, this originates in the 1940s and then goes on into the um, 70s, so-called 1976, so-called year of the evangelical when Jimmy Carter, who became president, startled reporters in talking about himself as a born again Christian and people had never really heard that and so that launched a whole um, effort to try to uh, study evangelicalism and figure it out. Um, but. What, what kind of relationship does Machen have to this later movement? And um, one of the things to keep in mind about evangelicalism is that evangelicalism is basically nice fundamentalism. Uh, a fundamentalist, people will say, is, a, is an evangelical who's mean or angry. Um, and evangelical used to be the case with somebody who liked Billy Graham. Uh, but evangelicalism of this more recent variety does emerge out of fundamentalism. It, it is an effort to, to present a kinder, gentler version of fundamentalism, say, but also to rebrand it, rename it. Um, and it's also important to keep in mind that a number of the people who were associated in the early days with creating this new brand of Protestantism that we call evangelical had studied with Machen or took inspiration in some ways from Westminster and Machen. Harold John Ockengay is a name that probably none of you recognize, uh, but he was um, the uh, Triple Crown winner at one point in American evangelicalism, being the uh, pastor of Park Street Church in Boston, president of Fuller Seminary, and the president of Gordon-Conwell Seminary. Not at the same time. For a time, though, he was actually pastor of Park Street in Boston and president of Fuller Seminary in the 1940s. Uh, Ockengay studied at Princeton, excuse me, at Westminster with Machen. Other people associated with the neo-evangelical movement in the 1940s had either studied at Westminster or knew about the, the kind of um, theological scholarship that was associated with both Old Princeton and Westminster. So in some ways there, there is a kind of a fi an affinity between um, Reformed Protestantism that Westminster and, and uh, Old Princeton stood for and the new, new evangelical movement. Um, but 
Part of the reason why Machen may not have been as useful, and this is, this is the question I, I guess I'm trying to answer in this talk, which may be somewhat convoluted, I hope it's not too much so, is why don't evangelicals say rally to Machen more if Machen was a, such a stalwart uh, figure uh, for American Protestantism, conservative Protestantism, in the first third of the 20th century, why don't more evangelicals uh, try to appropriate Machen in a, in a good way and just sort of say this is the sort of thing we, we stand for? Um, and the, the answer to that has a lot to do with the reputation that he had as a fighter. Um, in his own day, uh, Machen uh, was admired by a number of people, even some of his, his foes, for his uh, capacity to fight, which is maybe one, I maybe learned this from Machen, I don't, I don't mind pushback. Not to say that that's what you're doing, but I, 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 don't, I don't think that's bad. Um, I think it leads to greater clarity. Um, but Pearl Buck, a Presbyterian mi missionary, um, who uh, was very liberal and eventually left the church, and she was part of the, the controversy over missions in the 1930s. Uh, she said, she wrote this in, in the New Republic magazine, Machen um, was worth a <clears throat> hundred of his fellows who as princes of the church occupy easy places and play their politics and trim their sails to every whim who in their smug observance of the convention of life and religion offend all honest and searching spirits. Uh, this was written at, after Machen's death and she had hoped that Machen would go on living to continue to fight. So she had admired that kind of fighting even when it was directed at her. Now Buck is an unusual person. Most people don't like to be fought against. Um, you know, some people are ornery and some people are not, and, and she was in some ways that way. But the reputation that Machen had as a fighter, especially the people associated with Machen, uh, people in the OPC, people at Westminster, eventually gained reputation as being belligerent. Um, so just to give you a couple of examples of this, on the 50th anniversary of Machen's death, Mark Knoll, a uh, prominent historian of religion in the United States and who was then an elder in the OPC observed that the cost of Machen's contentiousness was large. He undermined the effect effectiveness of those reformed and evangelical individuals who chose to remain at Princeton Seminary with the Presbyterian Mission Board and in the Northern Presbyterian Church. Noel added that Machen left successors ill-equipped to deal with the more practical matters of evangelism social outreach and devotional nature. So Machen's cantankerousness got in the way of these other measures that might have been uh, more useful. George Marsden, another prominent historian of religion um, in the United States, also a son of the OPC. His father, Robert S. Marsden, was uh, one of the, uh, if not one of the original pastors very early on and very influential in the mechanisms of OPC's institutions for the first uh, 25 years or so. But his son, George Marsden, wrote uh, in a piece for Princeton Seminary Bulletin that said that Machen was characterized by cantankerousness. Um, he also criticized Machen at various times for his propensity to fight uh, Marsden said Machen had a personality that only his good friends found appealing, and he stood for a narrow, old-school confessionalism and exclusivism that many people today find appalling. That's a quote. Um, and then one more example of this idea that Machen had a reputation for fighting and that it wasn't necessarily a good thing, although this is directed more at some of Machen's followers than it is at Machen himself. John Frame who taught for many years at Westminster and then went on to teach at Reform Seminary in Orlando, wrote a book called Evangelical Reunion. Remember about what happens with reunions? Uh, he, he indicated his discomfort with the militancy that had characterized the OPC since its founding. And more recently, he said this in his uh, 
article that he wrote online called, well, it was also part of a fester for, I can't remember who, uh, mate, called Machen's Warrior Children. He, uh, Frame wrote, the Machen movement was born in the controversy over liberal theology. I have no doubt that Machen and his colleagues were right to reject his the this theology and to fight it, but it is arguable that once the Machenites found themselves in a true Presbyterian church, they were unable to moderate their martial impulses. Being a church without liberals to fight, they turned on one another. So there's this question of fighting, and that's part of the reason why Machen has perhaps limited appeal to later evangelicals and even some reformed pastors. So that only gets at some of this, though. There's also the question that we've been, I've been trying to address this conference series, question of ecclesiology. Uh, and is that also part of the reason why Machen has limited appeal? And it's also related to this question of fighting. Was Machen simply fighting liberal theology or was he fighting for a Presbyterian church? And if you know the history of Presbyterianism, which I'm increasingly becoming aware of, the his history of Presbyterianism before North America, you know that Presbyterians were always fighting, sometimes literally fighting, uh, in armies. Um, again, to bring up the Civil War of the 1640s in England and Scotland. Um, so there are different degrees of fighting, but think about evangelicalism now in this. Um, I can't remember what I have on my, uh, this, this just gave me a message of battery low, 20% left. Will that get me through this talk, you think? Pardon me, we'll just do this. Okay, thank you. Um, so how do we identify evangelicalism? Again, I'll say more about this tomorrow morning, um, but a lot of our evidence of evangelicalism comes from polling data. Um, and yes, so polls tell us that an evangelical <clears throat> is someone who has had a born again experience committing themselves to Jesus Christ if they have tried to encourage, or if they, secondly, if they've tried to encourage someone to believe in Jesus Christ, and if they believe that the Bible is the actual word of God. That's an older standard, but still useful for thinking about here. Using those criteria, the Gallup uh, Polling Incorporation finds that 22% of all Americans are evangelical Protestant, which means that roughly 30 million, that can't be right. That's gotta be 60 million. 22% of 335 million would be higher than, anyway. 60 million or more Americans are born again, a figure that makes evangelicalism the largest Christian group in North America. Sometimes Gallup uses a simpler tool for measuring evangelicalism. This so-called straightforward approach asks Americans if they apply the label born again or evangelical. The results are impressive if you like big numbers. According to Gallup, the percentage of Americans who say yes to this question has varied between a high point of 47% reached earlier in this year, 2005, and a low in, in, of 35% in 1996. If Gallup is right, and, and, uh, and who doubts opinion polls a decade ago Evangelicals counted almost 150 million Americans. That really is kind of a staggering number. But the question that goes with this is, is um, does that have any kind of coherence uh, to talk about a group of people based on their, their answers to three, maybe one question? Um, and to put that in contrast, think of the role that a, uh, a s members of a session uh, play in admitting someone to membership in a church. Um, there are a series of interviews that take place. Um, and, you know, the, you can't see into someone's heart in those interviews with prospective church members, or, or even when a child grows up to make profession of faith 
after having been baptized, um, and you ask a lot of the questions coming out of the shorter catechism, and then you hit the speed bump of the Decalogue, and usually children don't get to the la last part of the shorter catechism because of those 50 or so questions having to do with, I don't know if it's 50, but it's 40 at least, um, giving get with the law. Um, but, you know, you have these, these series of questions, uh, occasions for interviews of prospective members that, um, that then admit someone into the church. And you have some uh, reliance of saying, yes, this person is a true believer in Jesus Christ. Not that, I mean, again, if you, if you look at the, or the membership vows in the OPC, we don't require anyone to believe all of that that's in the Westminster Confession or, or the shorter and larger catechisms. We don't require people to believe in Presbyterian church government. We do ask them to submit to the authority of the local session. Um, we have five membership questions now, it used to be four, ranging from doctrine of the Trinity, the word of God, uh, commitment to leading a holy life, etc. cetera. Uh, but that's a lot more, it's not a whole lot longer to say than some of the polling data indicate, but still there's there's a, uh, a measure of coherence to that, which again is an indication that church government, church polity, the way that Presbyterianism operates uh, makes a difference. It, it's a way of giving some coherence and guardrails to Christian profession. A further indication that say perhaps uh, Machins stand for Presbyterian church government, as odd as it may seem, may be really useful, but also maybe not something that evangelicals want if they want large numbers that can register with, say, 45% of Americans count as that. Now, of course, during the Trump years, those numbers have, have uh, changed significantly. But <clears throat> um, here is a, a picture of the... Um, <coughs> The, the First General Assembly of the Free Church of Scotland, um, different kind of uh, gathering. Uh, so I have some, say, Presbyterian-friendly slides here. But this brings me to, though, a um, series of, of quotations I have from an article that uh, a man who used to teach English at Calvin College um, wrote in reflecting on his youth growing up in Northwest Iowa in the Christian Reformed Church. Now, for Orthodox Presbyterians today, the Christian Reformed Church may come off as liberal, and I would, I would agree with some of those sentiments, even though I myself, please don't hold this against me, was actually ordained as an elder in the Christian Reformed Church um, back at Wheaton CRC in the 90s. Um, but for between 1956 and 1962, the OPC and the CRC pursued union. Uh, there was a big affinity between the OPC and the Dutch Reformed world. Um, a great debt the OPC has to Dutch Reformed Protestantism. Think of Cornelius Van Til, obviously that name sounds kind of Dutch. Uh, Ned Stonehouse, who taught New Testament at, at Westminster, one of the original faculty. That name doesn't necessarily sound Dutch, but he's a Dutch American. Uh, R.B. Kuyper, not to be confused with Abraham Kuyper, and they even, R.B. Kuyper used an I, Abraham used a Y. Uh, again, another uh, Dutch figure who was prominent in the OPC in the first and second generation. So thinking about church life in Northwest Iowa is, uh, among the CRC is not necessarily uh, off point here. And, and this gives us a feel, this, this essay that Timmerman wrote gives a feel for what church life, especially Sabbath life, looked like in this small town. <clears throat> One can communicate facts <clears throat> of Sunday in my boyhood in a little Iowa town. The air full of bells <clears throat> three times that day. The well-filled filled churches and horse barns under August sun and January chill the nature of the church services, the pietistic regimen that controlled all activities, what is difficult to convey is the ubiquitous sense of Sunday that pervaded the day from dawn to dusk, from the first cock crow to the last wan chirp of the cricket, the stillness of the town. I never experienced such 
Sunday stillness again. Sunday was church. Oh, I got it. Sorry, <laughs> advance the slide. There's there's a uh, example of uh, Presbyterians preaching in Scotland. Um, of course, our churches don't look like that, but it makes a nice contrast to the images of evangelicals that I have here. <clears throat> Sunday was church in Orange City, Iowa, in the first decades of the century. I suspect that it is so even now in the little pockets of piety that dot northwest Iowa, though it can't be as still in the town or in the homes as it was in my youth. <clears throat> there were three services, not two, three services, which I attended with simulated docility. The preacher developed three sermons before his often critical sheep dressed in a somber Prince Albert, sweating it out in August afternoons with air conditioning, without air conditioning before a whir of variegated hand-propelled fans. He spoke in these churches, some of them large, without the aid of electronic devices. <clears throat> and a voice of good timber could be heard on the street through the open windows. <clears throat> there were always competitive babies in the crowd, quiet, quieted not by artful jouncing, but by breastfeeding. As the sermon pounded on, squirming little boys were pinched. Sometimes fractious older boys in the back seats were policed by elders. Dutch psalms were fervently sung while a lathering janitor, janitor pumped the bellows of the organ at 110 degrees. There was no choir and irrelevant impertinence. <clears throat> the heart of the service was the sermon. Upon that, the evaluation of the preacher and the determination of his, his ecclesiastical fortunes depended. <clears throat> then, as it was well into the 60s, that would be 1960s, it was as re rhetorically fixed as the terza rima. Apparently, all texts were best analyzed and interpreted in terms of three points. I remember a preacher saying, one more point, and then we go home. <clears throat> when the content was brilliant, whether the content was brilliant or mediocre, it was formulated in terms of an introduction, Three divisions and application. The th three points were often chosen with care and memorably phrased. <clears throat> As a boy, of course, I had no interest in these sermons. I spent my time counting the pipes in the organ, the panes in the colored glass windows, watching the consistory up front, and daydreaming. I'm glad that I later lear learned to appreciate the meticulous preparation, craftsmanship, and meditation that went into their making. Some of these older ministers operated on volubility, but others on a lot of mind and heart. Not a few had style, and some had class. There's the ordination of elders again. It's this kind of a, a jarring set of images here with the Dutch reform world and then the Scottish world, but bear with me. <clears throat> three services, three tip, trips to church, Three meals pretty well consumed the day. What time remained was to be used in a way compatible with the spiritual tone of the day. To many, this all sounds like a hard, hard religion, as well as something of a bore. In indeed, it took something out of one, but it put something real into one. The church was a sanctuary, a renewal of hope, a confirmation of faith. These people did not have easy pleasure-filled lives. They had a profound sense of the mystery and misery of human existence. There were no protective barriers. I remember my mother crying over the deaths of little children. Children were sometimes marred by smallpox, weakened by scarlet fever, dead of diphtheria. Diseases now almost routinely cured carried off parents leaving homes fatherless and motherless. Fearful accidents occurred on the farm. Hail, storm, and drought brought dest destruction, should be, to, to crops. And the death of the saints was precious in the sight of the Lord, and in the eye of the storm was the providence of God. How often these people prayed for a rainbow. How often they found a spiritual rainbow in the church, where God spoke to them through his servants and promised cure for all misery. <clears throat> At that time, this is Timmerman still going on, and even into the 60s, there was a remarkable consensus as to the meaning and practices of Sunday. 
Although the Bible did not specify the number of services to be held on Sunday, congregations attended with notable faithfulness and did not appear to grow weary of that kind of well-doing. Even though the services in the earlier decades of the century were a surcease from loneliness on the empty prairie, a stay against loss of identity in a strange land, and the warm concourse of friends, these were not the reasons that brought them to church. What did bring them to church was a felt spiritual need and a sense of duty. They believed God wanted them to come as often as they could, and it was good for them to be here. That kind of consensus has been eroding for years, whether out of spiritual amplitude, secular diversions, boredom, or alienation. <clears throat> I'll repeat. Whereas in the earlier decades of the century, attendance at church three times was common, today attendance twice is lessening. He's writing in the 1990s. Actually, 1980s, sorry. The blue laws have almost vanished. If a member of my old church in Iowa had spun his Buick over to the Blackstone Cafe at Sioux City for a Sunday dinner of prime ribbon cocktails, he would have been in danger of losing his membership. If one does that in Grand Rapids today, he risks only losing his shirt. The old blue laws were based on the idea that the Sabbath is a day of sacred assembly and that whatever, wherever you live, it is a Sabbath to the Lord. The older generation thought God made the Sabbath for man to ensure rest and spiritual growth, not to do what he wanted. They were uptight and possibly self-righteous about Sunday. The present generation is relaxed and self-righteous about it. Um, and Timmerman, I don't have this on a slide now, but Timmerman concluded by saying that he was thankful for the spiritual and insight and inspiration that he received over the years to have fragmented the day, to have fragmented the spirit of the day with antithetical secular diversions would have made Sunday almost instinct, indistinguishable from Thursday. <clears throat> Now, so what does this have to do with Machen or evangelicalism or the church? Well, it has a lot to do with the church. I hope you can see that. And it has one of the hallmarks of the church, Reformed piety, has been uh, church services, Sabbath observance, and the like. And, and again, this is a very different kind of um, uh, experience that evangelicals have I would argue, in their understanding of evangelical identity and what gives coherence to these many people who pollsters at least identify as evangelicals. <clears throat> um, and it, it's, it's a curious thing, the way that polling data, historical research, scholarship on, on Protestantism has gone to use these kinds of categories to understand uh, believers without having any real reference to the church. Um, and one of my frustrations uh, throughout most of my career, um, academic career at least, has been the um, being forced into a category that I never, well, that I don't think I ever really identified with. Um, but we live in a two-party society. Uh, we have Democrats and Republicans. We have for Protestantism, we have mainline and evangelical. Of course, now black churches become a little bit more prominent. It's not clear whether they're evangelical. They're not mainline. People don't know what to do with the black church. Um, but so if you're not mainline, you must go in the evangelical bin. So as an Orthodox Presbyterian, I get put in the bin of evangelicals, and I'm in there with people like Jimmy Swagger mm -hmm. and um, fellow down in Houston who's really uh, Joel Osteen or whatever. And it, it doesn't make any sense of those groups in that bin called evangelical. That's one of my frustrations with it. Scholarship should lead to greater clarity, not to greater confusion. <clears throat> um, I have many notes here, and I'm, uh, pages here. But the point that, uh, that I really am trying to draw this together from last night, this earlier this morning and now, is is the point about ecclesiology, and it's the one I think that I, we can also learn from Machen. Uh, the conversion experience and the piety that ev evangelicalism 
nurtures, at least according to pollsters, uh, has no genuine place for the church. Um, and you could probably even argue for the same thing when it comes to worship and Sabbath observance among evangelicals, though I don't want to sound self-righteous about that. To call evangelicals anti-church would be an overstatement. Evangelicals go to church and they support churches, but they have no real need for the church. It is an appendage to something more basic, which is the individual's personal relationship with God, having Jesus in your heart. The neglect of the church and its flip side uh, of a subjective personal relationship with God is what accounts for what I think is an anti-institutional strand of evangelicalism. Born again Protestants have trouble building attachments to institutions or traditions over generations like the one you see here with uh, in these series of quotes that I had <clears throat> because their understanding of genuine Christianity tells them that such atta attachments are a detriment or an obstacle or sometimes just an appendage to authentic faith. <clears throat> so consequently, while an Orthodox Presbyterian belongs to a church that confesses that ordinarily there is no salvation outside the church, and the Confession of Faith really does say that, an evangelical reads that line in the confession and giggles or thinks it's Roman Catholic. <clears throat> um, and this may sound like a series of overstatements about evangelicalism, but from the ground floor of evangelicalism, the kind that stressed the born again experience, the time of the first pretty good awakening, evangelicals who self-identify such, as such have been loath to admit any dependence on the institutional church. In fact, the advantage that evangelicals have gained against their competitors rested squarely on discrediting their opponents by observing the compromise involved in church structures, ecclesiastical hierarchies, and churchly ceremonies. Mark Knoll has argued that, quote, evangelicalism never amounted to a full-blown religious tradition, but was rather a style of personal living everywhere combined with conventional attitudes and actions. That's unquote. Because of its inability to achieve the heft of a religious tradition or of a denomination or of a communion or its inability to construct the doctrine of the church, evangelicalism has left many of its adherents in a curious dilemma, how to practice or belong to a faith that inherently rejects traditional Christian forms in search of an authentic religious identity. No. <clears throat> has conceded that evangelicalism has never been, quote, a hard-edged, narrowly defined denomination, but rather constitutes a set of defining beliefs and practices easier to see, and, and practices easier to see as an a, a adjective than as a simple noun, unquote. That means that an evangelical Lutheran makes more sense than, say, a Lutheran evangelical, because evangelicalism invariably modifies but you could also add or dissolves a Christian or Protestant tradition. It is more akin to a, a renewal movement within an existing church than a full-blown ecclesiastical identity. The reason is that from the beginning, evangelicalism has resisted formalism and pressed instead for a religion of the heart as opposed to one of externals. George Whitfield's early annou announcement of his strategy set the pattern for all, all subsequent evangelicals. Quote, it was best to preach the new birth and the power of godliness and not to insist so much on the form, for people would never be brought to one mind as to, as to that, nor did Jesus Christ ever intend it. That is, some kind of unity on the form. Which is really ironic for Whitfield um, because he was, you may not know this, but he was a priest in the Anglican Church. He was actually ordained in the Church of England. Uh, and yet he was able to minister in North American colonies without the oversight of a bishop for much of his career. <clears throat> so this has, I think, a lot to do, aside from Machen's reputation as being a fighter, 
uh, the idea that Machen fought to, to preserve a church and the theology of that church and the practice of that church in some ways is another reason why Machen is not as useful to evangelicals as he might be. Um, and also may indicate why Orthodox Presbyterians are not necessarily and have not been in the mainstream of uh, evangelicalism. Um, <clears throat> so this what do I have here at the end? I'll just leave that there and and try to sum this up in a, a um, relatively historical fashion by saying uh, why it was that Machen became less useful after 1940. One of the reasons was he died in 1937. It really would be interesting to see what Machen would have done with some of the developments that came along in the 1940s and 1950s had he lived relatively normal life expectancy, say if he had lived as long as H.L. Mencken did. Mencken was born in 1880, Machen in 1881. Mencken lived until 1956, but Machen died 20 years before Mencken. Um, so what would that have looked like? Who knows? We don't know. Uh, but <clears throat> five years after Machen's death, neo-evangelicalism, or what we call evangelicalism today, started. With especially, if you want to pinpoint it by institutions or forms, which I think are really important, when people actually sign up to join something, that's a pretty good indication, I think, of what they believe. Um, just having answering polls or even going out to protest peacefully, of course, in the streets is not an indication necessarily of where, where you spend your time and energy or even give your resources. So in 1942, the National Association of Evangelicals began. This was an agency that was trying to unite as many conservative Protestants as possible, also trying to give a much more positive face to conservative Protestantism, meaning that we're not fundamentalists, we're evangelicals. We're conservative, but we're, we're not mean. Um, and this was designed to be a, an organization that would try to rival the main line. The main line had the Federal Council of Churches, later the National Council, now evangelicals would have this organization. And a series of other institutions emerged in the 1940s and 1950s that we associate with evangelicalism. Fuller Seminary began in 1947. Fuller Seminary is maybe not regarded as highly and as, as reliable as maybe it once was. It went through a series of controversies, among them one over inerrancy in the 1960s that uh, really m very much changed the institution and a number of the conservatives at Fuller then went to Trinity Evangelical Divinity School north of Chicago. But for a time, Fuller was trying to be old Princeton itself it, when it started in 1947. And maybe not as belligerent, though, as Westminster, trying to do something a little bit different from Westminster. Um, and then in 1956 came a magazine, Christian, uh, Christianity Today, which is still in publication, still sort of the major voice, institutional voice for evangelicals. Billy Graham was one of the founding editors of that magazine, on the, at least editorial staff, uh, sometimes credited with founding the magazine. It, he was part of it, but he wasn't necessarily the, the, the guiding force. Um, and so those are, those are institutions that gave evangelicalism it, a measure of coherence. And of course, Billy Graham himself did. I mean, he was the poster boy for evangelicalism between, say, 1950 and 2010. Um, since Graham's death, which is more, more recent than that, uh, evangelicals really don't have a figure that kind of stands out that way. You have various celebrity preachers that could fill the vacuum, but even then you have Graham's son, Franklin Graham, who also source, sort of is in the lane that Billy Graham had tr driven in for much of his life. Anyway, so you have this coalition of conservatives. It is broad, and it's not the mainline church. And they rally around a very small set of nine doctrinal affirmations. But Machen's legacy was different from this. Machen was interested in forming a Presbyterian church. 
He founded Westminster Seminary. These are the three institutions of his legacy. He founded Westminster Seminary to train Presbyterian pastors. Of course, he trained, it wasn't de strictly denominational, although all the faculty would have been Presbyterian or Reformed. Uh, they trained Baptists, Methodists, other kinds of pastors as well, but that was its chief endeavor. He also founded a magazine, the Presbyterian Guardian, which for a, about 40 year run was a place where Orthodox Presbyterians and others could go to debate uh, the faith, debate doctrine in certain ways, report on the church, report on the broader reformed world. It was not an agency of, of the OPC, it was an independent magazine which gave it a little bit more freedom to treat matters uh, that were controversial. Um, <clears throat> and the Presbyterian Guardian eventually um, went out of business or went into something called the Presbyterian Journal, which eventually transformed into World Magazine. Um, and then uh, Machen's part, big part of Machen's legacy was, of course, the OPC, which was to have a reformed church, not a movement. This was designed to be a church. And again, looking at evangelicalism, the way I've suggested here in a few remarks, a church is too narrow, it's too confining. A church does not build a movement. There are too many boundaries that a church raises for having, say, something as big as 47% of the American population. Um, and, and that's an important metric. Having a large peop set of people who self-identify a certain way is useful for politicians because then you may try to form something like the Moral Majority in 1979. It's also useful for publishers and advertisers because, okay, we're going for this market. It, it becomes a market. Who would actually take out an advertisement in a major publication of any kind for the Orthodox Presbyterian Church? Or, but even the PCA, they wouldn't do that for them either, even though the PCA is three times, 10 times as big as, as the uh, OPC. They wouldn't even do it for the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod which is what, almost um, 10 times as big as the PCA. I mean, it's like 3 million or so. Um, so de denominations uh, just don't have that, uh, that, that appeal for sort of coalition movement uh, marketing purposes. And I'm not, saying, I'm not saying evangelicalism was simply designed as a marketing strategy. I'm not saying that at all. But I'm saying it grew up with that as part of the backdrop. And again, a church is something very different from that. Uh, and Presbyterian churches are, of course, different from other kinds of Protestant churches. And so Machen had a very narrow window. And he fought for that. And those were at least two strikes against him when it came to being of more service to later evangelicals or reformed Protestants. So. <clears throat> I think this helps to explain some of the earlier comments I, I uh, offered from M Mark Knoll, George Marsden, John Frame, why they may admire Machen as a critic of liberalism for having the insight and the courage to make that criticism, but then why they may also think that Machen's heirs, his followers in the OPC at Westminster, et cetera, may have hijacked the man. Um, and, and part of what I hope I've communicated this weekend is that you cannot have Christianity and liberalism, the book that Machen regularly receives very high praise for. You cannot have that book without Presbyterian theology or polity. Those were the ingredients that worked into it, and where that book led was at least to the OPC. Um, and I'll conclude with a uh, how this this uh, outlook, this Presbyterian outlook, um, worked its way out in the 1950s when Christianity Today, the magazine, started. Carl Henry was the original editor, content editor. Um, Carl Henry, I've recently reviewed a collection of his um, essays that CT, Christianity Today, is putting together. And it's really, I mean, he was a smart guy, very, very, very uh, capable man and a lot of insight in his, in his writing. Um, and one of the striking things about Henry's book was that he always had modernism sort of in the background. And this was a danger that evangelicals needed to be aware of. We have to be aware of modernism. 
And that, that, that fear of modernism has pretty much gone away, except in certain um, maybe small circles of, of confessional or conservative Protestants. Anyway, Henry's starting the magazine. He's looking for associate editors to include as regular contributors, et cetera, part of the magazine. And he turns to E.J. Young. E.J. Young, um, the, uh, who taught Old Testament at uh, Westminster for his career, studied, had studied at Old Princeton before Westminster uh, with Machen. <clears throat> Machen was really impressed with Young uh, as a Stanford graduate who knew his languages, et cetera, et cetera. Young was a really impressive scholar. Um, and so Henry asks Young to serve on Christianity Today. And this is part of what um, uh, Young wrote in response. As you well know, Carl, there was in the Presbyterian Church a great controversy over modernism. <laughs> Talk about an understatement. That controversy was carried on by Dr. Mark Machen in part. There were many who supported Dr. Machen in his opposition to unbelief. On the other hand, there were many who did not, did not support him. When matters came to a showdown and Dr. Machen was put from the church, there, was, there were those who decided it would be better to remain within and fight from within. Since that time, I have watched eagerly to see what would be done by those who remained in the church. They have done absolutely nothing. Not one voice has been raised, so far as I know, to get the church to acknowledge its error in 1936 or to invite back into its fold those who felt constrained to leave or those who were put out of the church. What has greatly troubled me has been the complete silence of the ministers in the church. They have simply not lived up to their ordination vows. And because there were PCUSA people attached to Christianity Today magazine, Young would not let his name be put on the masthead. Young would write for Christianity Today, so, but he didn't want to have an institutional affiliation with it. And that's, the, that's sort of the legacy of Machen right there. Um, again, it's narrow. It could look, could look mean, belligerent, all sorts of things. But there's also a, a kind of intellectual integrity, it seems to me, about that and a recognition of the issues. And so um, I guess I'll conclude and let Young have the, the last word, as it were. And I, and I put him together. I was going to create a slide with that quote up there, but I forgot to do that. And I apologize. Um, anyone can email me if they want the quotation. Uh, I'd be glad to do that. So um, I'll stop there, though, and take questions, comments, even pushback. <laughs> yes? I appreciated your characterization of um, feeling like there are only two bins for you and you get put in the evangelical bin. Um, but when you are asked if you're an evangelical or when Orthodox Presbyterians are asked if we're evangelicals, um, how, do you how do you answer that question and have you found a way to answer that that kind of uh, gains some traction or creates a, a useful discussion? Um, it depends on how much the person asking knows about the Protestant world. So if I'm at, at Wheaton, for instance, college, and somebody asks me if I'm evangelical, I, put, have a little, I probably put a little too much snark on and say, <laughs> no, I'm a confessional Protestant, you know, and you should know what that is. Um, if it's somebody like this, this former, well, friend who's now deceased, Leo Rebuffo, who was an agnostic, he had grown up in um, Roman Catholic Church, uh, but he was the guy who coined the phrase pretty good awakening. Um, if I talked to him about it, he, he didn't know anything really about orth OPC, Reformed Protestantism. He knew a little bit about evangelicalism from his dabbling in the literature. He wasn't really a religious historian, but he still talked about religion and politics. Um, <clears throat> so I could, with him, explain a little bit about the OPC and how it's different and its history and he knew about Machen. Um, but, you know, I couldn't go too far in the weeds with him. So it's, it's hard, in other words. I don't have a good answer, necessarily. It does depend on who's asking um, and how much of a, a jerk I want to be. Uh, uh, I hope my wife isn't watching. Uh, <laughs> yes? Uh, how, how big of a problem do you think that theological liberalism is today? And how much of a problem do you think it will be in the future? In the future? 
I, I think it's a huge problem. We don't talk about it much, um, if at all. Uh, again, references earlier in today about um, a division in the Methodist world. Again, the division there is over sexuality, not over theology. So even that's become now something they don't even think about. It's pretty much settled that you can have great, huge theological diversity in the mainline churches. I don't know if there would be as much opposition to a conservative minister in those circles. I think the only way you'd be <clears throat> uh, face some opposition in the mainline church if you were a conservative theologically would be if you opposed women's ordination or gay marriage or gay ordination. Um, I think that's the case. So it would still come down to those. That's sort of where the issues are. But I think, say, in the evangelical world, um, there's not nearly con as much concern as there should be about some kind of theological order. Uh, I, I read CT as much as I can read online for free. Um, and there are a lot of mainline Protestant voices at CT, just as there have been always. And I, I just don't sense that, that they are trying to preserve some kind of <clears throat> center position in theological matters. And I think even Gospel Coalition uh, dabbles in this because, again, of issues about social justice and whatnot. Um, I think probably in the Presbyterian world, you know, a question that I, I've talked to um, some of the podcasters there about is um, whether there's liberalism in the PCA. Um, and if you, if you define liberalism narrowly as the rejection of supernaturalism, I guess um, you would say that it doesn't exist. But I'm not sure if that, for some of the, the more, the word woke is getting overused, but I'll just use it as an as a easy way to say it. But I'm not sure the, the more woke people would say supernatural character of Christianity is essential to the faith. So it goes back again to the question um, fellow in the back raised, I forget your name, sorry, um, <clears throat> about how much theology gets pushed to the side or not, um, and how you can tell where the, the people are versus what uh, leadership is making issues of and helping to define the communion. So I, I do worry about trends in the PCA. Um, and it, 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 will, it will have repercussions for the OPC since we are, uh, in, we are together in fraternal relations and even share a common entity like Great Commission Publications, uh, a Sunday school publishing agency uh, that we've cooperated with them since 1975. And <clears throat> the COVID crisis has made it difficult for GCP to operate. Um, and so we're, we're working on that now. But there's also, I think, concerns among some Orthodox Presbyterians in the uh, Committee on Christian, Christian Education, as well as trustees of the Great Commission, about where the PCA is, is going. Um, so. It's a long-winded answer to say, yes, there is still, I think, an issue out there, and we should be concerned. Any other questions? Yes. Do you, would, uh, this is probably not a fair question. It's more of an opinion. Do you think the, what the OPC looks like now is what Machen would have envisioned that it looked like, or are there vast differences that you <clears> might think exist? Well, the question about whether the OPC now looks like what Machen may have thought it would look like. Um, there was, has been a, uh, a debate throughout the history of the church over why are we so small and whether Machen and some of the founders thought that it would be bigger. Um, since Machen died in North Dakota, preaching to a small little Presbyterian OP church there. Um, and since he was an incredibly busy man and took time out of his Christmas break to do that, I think he had a pretty good sense that the church was going to be small. And it may not be grow up to be a big church to rival the main line. But again, it's hard to know. 
But I think also, given the way the controversy had gone in the 30s and, and seeing people not rally to the side, I think he had lower expectations for what the church might be. So I think he probably would have would not be surprised necessarily. But what, what might have surprised him? Uh, there's a fellow on Twitter that I follow who's an elder now at one of the, our churches in North Carolina, very interested in um, Presbyterian history, both OPC and, and before that. And I think it's something like Ulster or something is his Twitter handle. Um, but he had a list of the original, say, 36 or 30 ministers in the OPC and um, sort of where they went over their career, just in sort of bite-sized uh, lines. And I think only 11 of the original 30 or so ministers remain in the OPC. A lot of them went to other uh, uh, communions, and not simply to the Bible Presbyterian Church. There was a split between the Bible Presbyterian Church and the OPC in 1937, and I thought a lot of those people who left would have gone there, but it wasn't the case. A lot, none of them, some of them went to the PCUSA, some of them went to the PCUS, the Southern Church. Um, they found other places to ministers, and I don't know if that means it was hard to get a church up and going, and this was during a depression, and there may not have been resources to sustain ministry. So it's not necessarily the case that they left because of convictions. They may have needed to support families um, and themselves. But still, I think that might be surprising. Yes? You know, uh, going back to the idea of the theology of liberalism and such, could it also be that, that what was happening and what's happening now to a certain extent, it really goes back to the authority of Scripture. Does it really say, uh, not just the, the idea of you know the mythical, supernatural things, but does it really mean what it's saying in regards to gay marriage or, or these issues that are, are coming into like the PCA? Uh, that the authority of Scripture, uh, as stated in our confession, is really the ultimate authority that we have for guiding the church. Right. No, no, and I, I think, think I think that's that's a very uh, good point, and it's one that I've come to think about more teaching at Hillsdale and interacting with <clears throat> converts to Rome or even people who are in Roman Catholicism. Of course, the um, big issue at the time of the Reformation was the sufficiency of Scripture itself and to, to um, have that be the sole authority for what the church does. And, and so on the one hand, as your question suggests, that gives you then clarity on, say, issues like gay marriage but it also gives you silence, say, when it comes to something like child labor. And, and that's, that's the dilemma, it seems to me, for a lot of people from the social gospel era down to the present with various social justice measures. The Bible won't let you say that from the pulpit. You may want to go out and do that on your own as an American citizen, but to simply live within the constraints of the Bible, both what it does say and what it doesn't say, has been a hard thing for Protestants to live with. Um, I mean, I hope you get that about child labor. I mean, there, there are children working throughout the Old Testament, it seems to me. So it would seem that the Bible doesn't condemn child labor, which doesn't mean that the Bible says you must have children work either. You may want to go out and, and pass legislation that says children can't work, but you're not going to preach it from the pulpit. You're not going to disfellowship anybody if they do have their children working, say. It, they're just issues that the church can address. And one of the things that hasn't come up here this weekend, um, but this doctrine of the spirituality of the church, which was also very much something that old school Presbyterianism stood for, and it goes with the doctrine of the church, and I guess I didn't want to get into it too much, but it has to do with the church has spiritual means for spiritual ends, and so it's not a political agency. I mean, there are times when it can speak to matters of morality, that may be involved in politics, but otherwise, the church should sort of just stay out of politics. Um, and uh, that's, that's a, it seems to me that's a further implication of sufficiency of scripture and the authority of scripture. But um, 
it, it's, it's sometimes that's even a hard sell among conservatives because they would like to have biblical warrant for supporting certain uh, measures in the political sphere as well. Well, did, 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 does that go back to the idea of, you know, it's written thousands and thousands of years ago, it really doesn't apply to us today. Right, right. It's a nice collection of ancient writings. But if it's the word of God, that's, that's, that could get your attention. <laughs> well, it's after, a little bit after noon. Uh, probably should wrap this up and I'll turn it over to our host. Well, thank you, Dr. Hart. Appreciate you uh, spending your weekend with us, being here uh, yesterday and today, and uh, I think he's going to enjoy a little bit of the local flavor here this afternoon, and, uh, some some uh, food and some some art and architecture. So, uh, uh, but we look forward to, to you, uh, if not exactly a continuation of what you've been speaking on, uh, at least some further elaboration on on the OPC and its relationship with evangelicalism. Uh, tomorrow during Sunday school. So if you're able to join us, uh, we will be live streaming again uh, tomorrow. So if you can't join us in person, uh, it will be uh, on our website and then uh, recorded for posterity's sake. So uh, you can uh, you can get a you can go back and uh, uh, check things out later on for further uh, <laughs> for further use and further benefit. Uh, but we're grateful for you to, to have been here with us for this conference, and uh, it's a, it's taken on a, a slightly different shape than it has in previous years. Um, but uh, we're thankful for you all to have have come out and spent the day with or the morning with us uh, and we look forward to seeing as many of you back tomorrow uh, as possible so again thank you I think there may be one of Dr. Hart's books left on the table uh, it's at the bargain basement uh, uh, bargain basement uh, price of seven dollars uh, which we uh, uh, that's just uh, it's not that I mean he, don't worry Dr. Hart will get his full royalties for the from the sales of these books but we just uh the church is underwriting about half of the cost of what it, what it cost us to buy them from Westminster Bookstore, uh, just so to, to to get these resources in your hands. So uh, uh, take advantage of that and make sure you get uh, Dr. Hart to sign it and uh, and spend some time. Uh, we uh, we won't kick you out right away. Uh, look forward to fellowshipping with you and visiting with you for a little while after the conference is over. So thank you for being here, and uh, Lord willing, we'll see uh, some of you tomorrow. Thanks. Thank you. Any of you